Hey, I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, this evening. Uh, we are uh, finishing the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, like I said before, uh, we've got, gotten to the Apostles' Creed. There's just a lot of information, a lot of doctrinal of areas where all this connects. And so, you know, we you teach the first three chief parts, you got three quarters of the doctrinal content there. You know, and then we get the last three chief parts when you're teaching confirmation, it goes by fairly quickly because most likely you're covered at some other point uh, along the way. But I'd like to begin our time here uh, this evening. Uh, Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, you sent your Son to be our Savior, and uh, you promised us, Lord, eternal life. And not only eternal life, resurrection life. And Lord, we pray uh, that you would be with us as we talk about the end days, as we talk about the resurrection to come. Uh, that we may give bold witness to what you teach us in your word and be comforted, Lord, that the best days are yet to come. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, the best days are to come, right? Uh, these light momentary troubles of this life are nothing, Paul says, compared to the eternal glory in which um, will be revealed to us on the last day, right? And so our focus as Christians is always forward-looking, always into the future. Uh, not just the day when we die, not just spending eternity in heaven with Jesus as kind of a disembodied soul, but we look forward to the last day and to the resurrection to come, okay? Um, all right, so we're on uh, page uh, 222. Uh, so this is the third article, part three. And uh, so this covers the last part of the meaning here. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. And this, along with everything else in that meaning, uh, Luther says, this is most certainly true, right? Okay, the central thought here is um, all people yearn for a better future and hope that things in their lives and in the world will improve. What sort of, what sort of future do people today hope and long for? What sort of future do people today hope and long for? Andrew? Some people hope that they'll become rich and famous just by, uh, just by playing video games on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, there's those that are just open the play, win it big, right? And in our high-tech culture, uh, you can kind of make a living just playing video games, right? And video game competitions, um, hoping to make it uh, rich uh, through those competitions. Uh, how else do people, uh, what other hopes do they have for, for the future? Peace on earth. Okay, peace on earth, right? Every beauty pageant contestant, I mean, you're going to get a right answer, is, is always peace on earth, right? <laughs> World peace, okay? Um, and, and certainly that is a, a laudable goal. Um, but will that be achieved in this world? Sadly, no, right? That's the hope of communism, right? The, the promise of communism is that there will be peace when there's equity in everything, right? That's, that's what uh, communism uh, taught in everything. And of course, uh, you know, as we live as Christians in this world, we know that's not going to happen. The best we can do is, is uh, work for a just society as much as we can, because we're all sinners, until that day when Jesus does return and make everything right, right? Okay, what other kind of hopes... Uh, do people have for the future? To live a long, healthy life. Okay, to live a long, healthy life. And, and that word healthy is probably just as important as the long part, right? Uh, I kind of sometimes uh, tease uh, some of those who are in the golden ages that, uh, you know, they're all having all sorts of health issues. And so I said, well, the golden age, ages, it, you know, it really stands for you got to have a lot of gold to take care of yourself because everything starts falling apart, right? Um, but people want a long, healthy life. How many people have searched for the quote-unquote 
fountain of youth, hoping that they would stay forever young. And, and they thought they might have found it uh, you know, a decade or two ago with Botox, right? And that was a big craze in all these things, right? Um, people long for those long, healthy lives. But is that, is that a wrong thing? What's that? If you don't make it deep in you, it's wrong. I didn't catch the first part, Merlin. If you don't make it deep thing. Okay, if you don't make it the thing. Okay. All right. I mean, within the right context, we can understand that this is okay, right? Because isn't that what God created us for? I mean, in the very beginning, didn't God create us to live long, like in the sense of forever? <laughs> And be healthy, right? Be perfect. And of course, all that got ruined, Genesis 3 and 4, right? So the yearning is there, right? The yearning is there. But uh, we understand as Christians that that's not going to happen because of sin in this world, right? Uh, let's go ahead and, and read Acts 24, verses 14 through 21. Again, uh, what... For what did Paul claim he was on tri trial, and what was his hope? Again, this is Acts 24, verses 14 through 21. With this I confess to you that according to the way which they have called a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, these men them, themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and unjust. So I always take plans to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now after several years I came to bring alms to my nation and present offerings. While I was doing this they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me or else let them these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council others that others than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day okay thank you very much Jen uh, okay so again for what did Paul claim he was on trial and what was his hope Okay, he is, he's claimed to be on trial for the resurrection of the dead, right? And what's his hope? It's the same thing, right? He's hoping in the resurrection. Now, why is Paul saying that he is on trial for the resurrection of the dead? Well, because of Jesus, right? To believe in Christ believe, means you believe in the resurrection of the dead because Christ rose from the dead, right? And because Christ rose from the dead, that means I will also rise from the dead. Okay. Uh, now notice uh, that uh, Paul talks about that I confess to you that according to the way, uh, this is an early name for the Christian community. You know, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. And early Christians picking up on that saying, uh, uh, refer to the church uh, as the way because they followed Christ and he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, so uh, just one of those early names or references to the church there. So pastor, which group yes. did not believe in the resurrection? Was it the Pharisees, Sadducees? The Sadducees. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the Pharisees did believe in uh, a resurrection, okay. but the Sadducees Sadducee. didn't. Yeah, and, and that's why, you know, Paul's making a big reference here is that when he entered the temple, uh, he was purified. Now, who ran the temple? It was the Sadducees. Okay, they ran the temple. Okay, uh, they were part of the, that priesthood there. Uh, the Pharisees were more of uh, the common teachers kind of spread out into the, the various communities teaching in the synagogues. And that's where... 
the Pharisees had their biggest influence on people is, is through the synagogues, okay, and through teaching there. The Sadducees were mostly regulated to uh, the temple, and uh, they were people who just did not believe in any sort of resurrection. Okay. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay. So, uh, as Christians, we yearn for the resurrection of the body and life eternal in the new heavens and new earth. The time when we will be perfectly pure and holy uh, people, free from sin, death, and all evil, in a new, immortal, glorified body. Okay? So, how might our hope of the resurrection affect the way we view suffering within this world? How might our hope of the resurrection affect the way we view suffering in this world? It's temporary. Okay, it's temporary. Okay. How else? As an honor. Okay. Why would you say an honor? Well, I think about the martyrs that, okay. that did that and, you know, what Jesus did for us. It okay. was... You know, and if he did that for us, then, you know, what should we do in respect back to him? I mean, yeah. to show our love and respect. Yeah. So. Well, and of course, it's, that's very biblical because uh, I think it was Peter and John. They are called before the religious leaders and they left rejoicing because they were counted worthy as suffering for the name. Of our Lord Jesus Christ so uh, yes so there's that and it is a temporary thing it's not forever hell now that's suffering forever right but uh, suffering in this world isn't um, so how, how might else might our, uh, the resurrection uh, affect the way uh, we view suffering in this world any other thoughts with that Tolerating it better, okay. Any other thoughts? Well, you have to look ahead to what what will be. You know, it's not going okay. to do it any good to look behind us. Okay. But what's ahead of us? Because as I tell midweek, um, I said we're on the journey right now. Mm -hmm. So we haven't gotten to our destination, but we're on that journey. Mm -hmm. So you know, I guess we we have to keep our eyes on. Jesus and yep. our salvation. Yeah. So doesn't suffering point us beyond our present circumstances to the hope of maybe it's a healing, maybe it's it's the resurrection to come on the last day. It points us out of ourselves, out of our current situation to everything being made right again on the resurrection when Jesus returns, right? Um, and, and we see that, you know, somebody in the hospital they're looking forward to the day when they're out of the hospital. They're not focused so much on the present time, although that might be long, but they look forward to getting out. If they didn't, you know, everything would be so much worse, right? But they look forward to that time where they, they're, they're out of the hospital. We look forward to that time when we are out of this world, as far as the, this world of corruption and sin, and look forward to the day when everything's made right when everything's made holy and perfect again right and, that, and and so our thoughts are always forward looking right okay so a closer reading at the small catechism is page 223 uh what will happen when jesus returns visibly uh god will raise me and all the dead you know so job 19 i know that my redeemer lives right and at the last, he will stand on the earth. Okay, so this isn't a kind of a spiritualized thing, right? But he's talking about a physical revelation here. And after my skin and thus has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my, my eyes shall behold, and not another, and my, my heart faints within me. So, you know, Job is looking for that day when 
everything's made right, and he will behold the Savior with his own eyes. And, just, and as I was reading that, I was, I was thinking, boy, how powerful those words are for me, someone who's blind, or gone blind at least, to, to know that that will be restored as well as their life, right? Um, so um, Jesus says in uh, John chapter 5, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear his voice and come out. <coughs> Excuse me. And those who have done good uh, to the resurrection of life, and then those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Okay, so there, there is a distinction in those who are raised, right? But all people are raised. It is, it's both the church and those who are not of the church will be raised. Um, so what will my resurrection body be? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed uh, first, Thess first Thessalonians 14, or 4 verse 16, excuse me. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump, sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Again, there's a distinction made between uh, the church and the unbelieving world. The church... The body of Christ, those who believe in Christ, will rise first, right? Uh, and then uh, the rest, okay? So what will my resurrection body be like? Well, Jesus will raise my body and transform it into a glorified body for eternal life in the new creation, okay? So my body right now is, corrupt, is full of corruption, it is connected to this world and, and the corruption, the decay of this world. But when all things are made new, I will get a body. It'll be the same body, but yet a glorified body for the life to come, right? Uh, new brand spanking new, right? <laughs> no warts or anything else. Uh, so this comes from Philippians chapter 3. Uh, he, that is Jesus, will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body so you, you kind of think of transfiguration when jesus glory is revealed on the mount even for a, a, that brief moment but uh also the pictures of him in revelation where he is glorified right um we'll, so our lowly body will be like his glorified body by the power that enables him to subject uh, all things to himself <clears throat> and john says in first john that we shall see him as he is for we will be like him okay so that's first john chapter three the first or second verse there we will be like him we'll see him as he is which is quite remarkable right because in the old testament what would happen if you saw god you die right and, and most time you're you're covering you can't bear to look but we will see him as he is we will be like him how is he? He is holy, righteous, without sin, right? Uh, living forever, eternal. Okay, we will be like him. Okay. Um, First Corinthians fifteen. Uh, again, this is uh, the wonderful resurrection chapter of the scriptures. Uh, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. Uh, what is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. What is, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, right? So, again, this is what we have to look forward to. Uh, not just dying in this world, but being raised, being glorified, being uh, in a new creation, a restored creation with Christ. Whatever that looks like, however that materializes in front of us. Uh, it will be for us, right? Any questions up to this point? On 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, when it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first, is this where the rapture comes in? Um, not quite yet. Uh, it's in that context. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I will hit on the rapture a little bit later, so I'll, I well, promise I'll just, come back to that. Well, they, you know, that's what they say, those people, yeah. I mean, those in Christ. Right. 
we're going we're going we're going to take this and some of the the other verses and we're going to fit them in the context and we'll talk about the rapture okay, okay? um okay so what will happen on the last day uh, to those who have rejected christ unbelievers okay um unbelievers will also rise bodily but to eternal death namely to shame and torment and hell forever and that's why there's that uh, that mission imperative for the church. You know, we don't want anybody to perish. We want them to be with us, uh, with Christ forever. And so that's where the ferventness of the church to reach out in mission work, to reach out to those lost souls comes from. We want them to uh, be with us, to be with Christ forever, because the alternative is this, okay? Remember, there's no middle ground. You're either with Christ or you're not. You're either in the church or you're not. Okay? When we're talking about the church here, remember, I'm talking about the invisible church, right? Uh, the, the, the whole sum of all believers in Christ, the body of Christ. Okay? It doesn't matter if you have your name on the church roster. You need to be part of the body of Christ. Okay? All right. Um, so, Isaiah 66, verse 24. Uh, and they shall go out and look on the dead uh, bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in an abhorrence to all flesh. Not a pretty picture here, right? Uh, Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then Matthew 25, verse 41, then they will say to the, or sorry, then he, that is God, uh, our glorified uh, Savior, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Who was hell prepared for? Was it for unbelievers? For the devil. For the devil and his angels, right? Yes. See, it's not. It was never God's plan to send people to hell, right? How do you get there? Rebelling against God, unbelief, gets you there. Make sense? I guess choosing the wide road, not the narrow. Choosing the wide road, not the narrow road, right? Uh, yeah, that road that says all religions lead to the same place. Uh, that leads you to the southern. Uh, place right the the, the warm the warm the warm trending area right <laughs> so um, okay let's go to Luke chapter sixteen verses nineteen through thirty one so Luke chapter sixteen there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abram replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let them... Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so here you get, you get a, a picture here, right? Uh, Lazarus is poor, right? He's got sores on his body. He's, be he's a beggar. He dies. 
He goes to Abraham's bosom. The rich man, living his best life now, dies and goes to hell. Okay, so Jesus is making clear that there is this distinction already here. And there's this distinction that's made already at the time of death. Okay, uh, you know, so when, when death comes, comes the judgment. Okay, and then there's the resurrection, which confirms that uh, in everything. But already at death, there, there's that judgment. Okay, and, and so that's why you say there, there's no such place, time, as, as no such thing as second chances, right? Not once death comes into play. There's no such thing as purgatory. Okay, you're either with Christ in the bosom of Abraham, or you're with uh, the devil and his angels. You're in hell. Okay, and, and that takes place right at the moment of death. Then why all the masses for the dead? Why all the prayers? Why all the money to the priests for masses? I mean, when somebody dies in the Catholic Church, why? It's a good money maker. <laughs> and sadly, a lot of it, it comes down to that, right? Uh, it, it comes down to a misunderstanding of, well, it's, it leads into the penance system, right? And a misunderstanding of sin, misunderstanding what Christ has done, because, again, uh, rip, Christ died for original sin, but not actual sins in the Roman Catholic teaching. And that's why there's that penance system. You're there to work off your sins, okay? That's why they tell you to use so, so many good works and everything. You're making up for your sins, okay? Because Jesus died for actually for your for your original sin, but you are responsible for the sins that you commit afterwards. And so it's a huge, elaborate system. And if you don't get it worked off in this life, don't fear. There's purgatory. You'll go through that. You'll be cleansed. You'll suffer there, but you'll be cleansed, and then finally come out on the other end. So how do you know if you've worked off enough in this life? Who tells you? Uh, that's ultimately up to the judge, they would say, you know, about how much time you're in purgatory. But most people are there for millions of years. <laughs> so, or, or at least thousands of years. So, according to teaching. Okay? What's his purgatory like? It's, it's hell with an escape hatch. You know, because there, there, there's an out, there's an out. But basically, how they describe it is basically hell. You know, you're, 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 it's a place of suffering and torment to burn off all the sin that you've accumulated in this life so that you may come out on the other end purified, like gold is purified. So the prayers are supposed to help the masses. That, that's supposed to help, yes. But I'm not here to... Justify their system. <laughs> yes, sir. When did the church start the purgatory? Parts of teaching it. Um, golly, probably around 1,100, 1,200, 80. I mean, it's it's been around for a long time, but it, it doesn't go go back to scriptures, you know, and. It's really an unbiblical doctrine. You cannot justify it through the scriptures. Just you cannot. So then not everybody goes to purgatory. If you've done enough here, you wouldn't have to be, right? Or your time there is going to be extremely short. Yeah. But that, that's only for the that's only for the real good saints, you know, maybe like for the popes and so forth. There's only one pope, right? I don't like this. <laughs> Does that leave the rest of those people? Where, what, I mean, I don't understand that. Does going to church, is that one of those things? Well, that's a good work. That, that gives you credit. But again, it's your work. Rather than, it, rather than it being God's service to us, it's your work. It's your work. So, again, there's the religion of works, and there's the religion of grace. Okay, the Christian faith is a religion of grace. Christ has done it all, right? Now, my life is a response from the works that I do. That's the fruit of faith. But uh, 
that, that's only the response to what I've been given in Christ. And even that is God's work through me. You know, Ephesians 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. Right? So again, Christ is doing that work in and through us. And I know in James it says, faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. They really take that to the limit, don't they? They kind of do, yeah. All right. So, uh, let's see here. So summarizing here, uh, so the Spirit works through the Gospel. He brings faith. This brings a new life uh, to, to us right here, right now. Okay? This new life is not the resurrection. This new life is the new life that God has given to you in your baptism. It's yours already. Okay? Which means that you and I can live in this new life right now. That how we live is we're either living in this new life or we're going back to the natural life, the life of, that leads to death. Okay? Uh, there, there's, a, there's the, you know, the uh, church fathers uh, would talk about the way of life and the way of death. Okay? You're either on one path or you're on the other. So the new life is ours right now. At the moment of death, we go and be with Christ, but we look forward to the resurrection for eternal joy and peace. For those who are, don't believe, uh, death does come, and there's resurrection, but that leads to, again, eternal torment and hell. Okay? And that's something that uh, the world doesn't like to hear. You know, most Christians, uh, by polls, or at least people who say that they're Christian or believe in God, and I think it's more genetic that you simply believe in God, don't believe in hell. Well, that, that's very convenient because if there's no hell, that means there's no punishment. There's no consequence for my actions, right? So I can live how I want, right? I can, I can live like this, this, this natural life here and still expect to come over here, right? Isn't that how people think, right? This is the wide road, but it leads to here. This is the narrow path that leads to joy and hope. Okay? Okay. Questions or thoughts on that? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so connection applications. Why do people die? This is the reason why people die. You don't die of camp from cancer. That might be the thing you're struggling with at the end or heart disease, or whatever it might be, COVID, that's not why you die. The reason why you die is the terrible consequence of sin. Okay? Why did we get COVID? Why did we get cancer? Why did we get heart disease or anything else? Why does this little thing come? Because of sin in our lives, and the natural result of sin is death. Okay? Uh, and that's why we die. So, uh, Romans 5, uh, verse uh, 12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, right? Uh, so that is the great equalizer. That, that, that puts everybody in the same category, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, Romans 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus so Jesus is the antidote, if you will. He is the solution to the problem of sin and death. So what happens to me as a Christian when I die? Well, when I die, the God-given unity of my body and spirit will be broken. I will immediately be in the presence of Christ in heaven, but my body will remain in the grave until the resurrection. Okay? Um, so Philippians uh, 1, verse 23 and 24 I am hard-pressed between the two, Paul says. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. Uh, but, I th but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, right? Again, Paul is heavenward focused. He is uh, focused on the resurrection to come. Uh, Paul says a little bit later in Philippians, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, we're citizens here of the United States, but the citizenship that really matters is the one that comes to us in baptism, right? Comes to us, uh, that gives us our citizenship papers of heaven. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Um, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Again, that kind of undercuts the purgatory aspect, right? Today you will be with me in paradise. Not in a million years or a thousand years once you kind of worked off things in purgatory. Jesus doesn't say that. Today, okay, or more or more, when you die at that moment, you will be with me. Okay. All right. So the note here is that the Bible refers to heaven as both sky and the dwelling place of God and the holy angels. Uh, heaven or heavens and earth describe the entire created universe. God dwells in heaven far beyond us and our ability to comprehend. Thus, heaven remains a great mystery until we are united with Christ. What we know with confidence is that in heaven, God hears our prayers and sees our needs, and that he sent his Son, uh, sent his son from heaven for our salvation. Because Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, not, he now promises all who trust in him that, that death has no power over us, and we will remain with him in his heavenly dwelling. Okay. So, the Roman Catholic teaching of purgatory is that there is a state or condition after death for souls to be purified for entrance into heaven. It is thought to apply only to believers who need cleansing from the penalty of their sins. Okay? Again, you're responsible for the sins that you commit in this life. Okay? Uh, so this teaching, I want to make it clear, this teaching is contrary to the scripture and to the gospel. Okay? There is no such thing as purgatory. Okay? All right. So then, what will happen uh, to me uh, when I am raised from the dead on the last day? I will enjoy being with Christ in his new creation in body and soul forever. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So is that neat? Not everyone's going to experience death. There's going to be those who are still alive at the resurrection. Okay? Uh, on that day, the, 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 the graves will be opened, the dead will be raised imperishable, Paul says, right? Um, but then we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, right? At the twinkling of an eye, and we'll be with Christ forever, okay? So again, this is a wonderful day. This is, this is the Christian hope. This is the Christian hope. And uh, like I said, when we talk about simply being in heaven at a funeral, we're only giving half the hope. Okay? The Christian hope is in the resurrection. Because if there is no resurrection, why did Christ have to be raised from the dead? What are we really celebrating every Sunday? What are we really celebrating on Easter? Right? Um, the resurrection matters. And the resurrection comes to us already. Um, uh, so let me uh, let's turn to Romans uh, chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Okay, so uh, starting at verse 1, um, how far should we go here? Uh, let's read from verse 1 through 11 on Romans chapter 6. Someone want to read that for us? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that 
that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you do not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, that by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay. So what's Paul talking about here? What's Paul talking about? Isn't he talking about resurrection? For what for Paul What's the resurrection look like? Doesn't he talk about it in two senses, right? There, there's like, like two resurrections. There's that spiritual resurrection by which we are buried with Christ and are raised to Christ, right? Uh, so, you know, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We've died with Christ, died on the cross with him, and we are buried with him by baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. This is baptismal language. This is resurrection language. The two go hand in hand, Right? We've been raised already in Christ. Now, Paul is talking about that new life given to us that we can call a spiritual resurrection, right? Because we still have the body that's still encumbered with sin, okay? But he's talking about a spiritual resurrection, a, a new life that's already ours right now. And then at the end of days, uh, Christ will raise the body from the dead, okay? But eternal life is already given you right now. Your, your soul will not die, right? It's that separation. You close your eyes, the next thing you know, you're with Christ. But then there's the resurrection. The graves are open, and the next thing you know, you're in your body, uh, and you're with Christ. Okay? Do you see that distinction there? Okay? The Bible talks about this in those two senses because... Uh, the Bible also talks about not only the body being dying, but that the soul is already dead. You know, Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's talking about a spiritual death there, not a physical one, right? Okay. And because we've been, we are born spiritually dead, we've been raised already spiritually dead. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> what happens if we don't accept that? What do you mean? If we don't, okay, let's say, okay, we're, we have that. It's ours. Okay. What about people that don't accept that? Accept that new life that's been given to us? Right. If uh, they can, don't. So can you give me a little bit more of a concrete example? No, because I'm confused. So you're, can't. you're confused? <laughs> well, if they, okay, we have that, I mean, we, that's, we have that spiritual, I mean, yeah. you know, we have it. We, it's ours, right. You know, our soul is mm -hmm. saved. But what if somebody says, no, it isn't, uh-uh, because -uh, I'm not in heaven yet. No, it isn't. What do you tell them? Well, you will die again. I mean, you will yeah. die physically. Right. But your soul is not going to. Yeah. It'll be just like that. 
ultimately, you know, if a person denies that, what they're probably most likely is that they're denying original sin. They're denying uh, what sin truly does to us. Okay? They're, they're thinking, I have spiritual power in myself to choose Jesus. Right? Because uh, a lot of times we don't make that distinction between the, the soul and the body. And... Um, but, but they fail to realize, as Paul's telling us in Ephesians 2, we are born dead. Yes, dead to sin. Okay, there's a lot of Christian churches that don't get that. They believe that you have a certain amount of spiritual power, therefore you can be pleasing to God by your works. Okay? Uh, this is part of Roman Catholicism, but it's also in some Protestant churches as well. Okay, uh, A lot of times, sin isn't seen as that corrupting influence on my nature, but rather it's just relegated it to the bad things that I do. Now, I can stop doing those bad things by my own will. Maybe with a little help from God, but I can, do, I can stop those, from doing those bad things. But the thing is, I, I can't. Sin has that detrimental effect on me. Christ needs to come and liberate me because I am dead in my trespasses and sins. What can a dead person do? Nothing except receive the new life that Christ gives to them, right? So, uh, going back to the American history Civil War, you had the slaves. How were the slaves freed? By a proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation, right? Did, so that came from outside of them. There's nothing a slave could do in order to free themselves. Escape to the north. Maybe. Right? Let's they just say they can't. Let's, let's just say they can't escape from the to the north, right? Okay. Because they can't. Okay. The, the, say the Underground Railroad. It was only in certain places, right? Yes. The majority of the slaves did not were not able to escape. Correct. Right? They could not escape. Right. right. Same thing for us. We cannot escape on our own. We are dead in our trespasses. We need the Emancipation Proclamation of the Gospel to come and to save us, to come to us and free us, to give us life. That's the Gospel. Because it brings us Jesus. It brings us the forgiveness of the cross and the, re and the resurrection to come. Uh, does that make sense? That. What's that? If you okay. deny it and say no, I don't believe that. Then your soul won't end up. I mean, it's not eternally safe. Well, let me say that a person who believes in Christ is necessary for salvation. You know, the Spirit is working on them; they're saved, even if they have some false doctrine. But you're right; there comes a point where that false doctrine leads them. To away from Christ and away from the, the, the that's that's why false doctrine is so bad because it leads us away from Christ. So I'm not going to say pe people in other churches are not Christian, you know, there's no believers there, but I'm going to say the false doctrine in those churches make it easier for them to fall away, right? Just like in the Lutheran church, not knowing the correct doctrine, not being in the word, not studying the word, and keeping up with the word can. Do the same thing. Oh, I agree. Right. Yeah, you have to know what your church teaches. Well, you have to know what the Bible teaches more. Yes, right? and that's what we believe in. But if you don't, then well, well, do the Catholics know what they, you know, what their church teaches? I mean, um, I'm I mean, sure. some of them do not. Yeah. I mean, if you're denied communion. Evidently, you don't. They, they have the same issues that we do in the Lutheran Church. See? There are those that know God's word more, or in their own Catholic doctrine, probably know what the church teaches more. And there's those that don't. Okay? And don't think they need to know. Don't think they need to know. Exactly. But the less you know, the more, the more you are subjected to the winds of the culture and of the world. Uh, why would we not want to know God's word, right? Why would we not want to be in the word of God and grow in that word of God? Okay. Uh,
because God's word is the antidote <laughs> to this world, right? It really is. Okay, let's move on. Uh, all right. So what will the new uh, creation, or see, what, what will happen to this world uh, after we Christians are raised from the dead? Well, the present uh, creation, like our own bodies, will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and God will create a new heavens and a new earth. And uh, uh, Paul talks about the world being subjected to, to futility, but also that there is... Uh, that the creation itself groans inwardly, e eager for the adoption of, as sons. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The creation uh, is looking forward to the re revelation of the sons of God to be revealed. Okay. Uh, James one verse eighteen. Of his own will he brought us forth from the world, from the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Okay. So Paul's already taught, or not. Paul but James is already talking here that even right now as we come to faith in Christ, we're already part of that first fruits of what is to come. Okay. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 5. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Okay. There, this world will pass away, but it's passing away in the same sense that our bodies are passing away. Is, it's going to come to a point where there's no where the, the corruption gives way and it goes away and then there is a beautiful pristine creation again okay we are going to be living in a physical world because we are physical people right um, to be human is to be body and soul that's what it means to be human okay uh, when we go and we just think about being in heaven apart from the body, uh, we are not, we're, we're thinking that we're going to be something other than human, right? That's where some of the false ideas that we become angels and all this kind of stuff comes into play. Okay? We are human. And uh, God, uh, on the last day, will make us fully human again. Make sense? Okay. Um, so what, is, what, what will the new creation be like? The new creation is described in ways that are both familiar and mysteriously unfamiliar. The Bible describes a new heaven and new earth in terms much like creation before the fall, but entirely new and also different in certain ways. Okay. So we're not going to go through all these scripture passages. There's a number of them um, that are listed there. I'll just commend them for you to read. Um, I'll just pick up on a couple of them. Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or to come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. So, again, Old Testament here, already talking about a new heavens and new earth. Okay? Already talking about that. So this isn't something strictly... A, it's not strictly a New Testament idea, okay? Um, Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Okay? Um, Matthew 22, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And of course, it's talking about human beings, Right? Marriage is something for this world. Marriage will not be in the world to come. Okay. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> do we know when this will take place? And the answer is no. Uh, we do not know when the last day will come. First Thessalonians, verse five, uh, chapter uh, verse two, or chapter five, verse two. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And Jesus says, therefore, you must always be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. And then although we do not know when the last day will come, we know that we are currently living in the last days of the world and should be watchful for Christ coming. Okay? Um... Jesus says in uh, 
Mark chapter 13. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And then Revelation 22, verse 20, he who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So, um, what will happen on the last day? Well, okay. So, um, uh, what does that look like? So, this is from the Lutheran Study Bible. So, if you have the Lutheran Study Bible, this is actually in the introduction section of the book of Revelation. Okay? Um, so, here's the false timeline. This is a, typically a, a millennialist timeline. Okay? Uh, and the rapture, the false teaching of the rapture, which talks about a, a, a secret return of Christ to gather his church on earth uh, at some point, uh, fits into this uh, teaching, but not, not always, but generally it does. So this false timeline has Christ's visible life here on earth. You got the church age. Christ returns secretly uh, to resurrect or rapture all true Christians. Okay? And then you have a seven-year tribulation. Uh, the battle of Armageddon takes place. And then you have a visible return of Christ to bind Satan and begin the millennium. The thousand-year reign. Okay? So you have a thousand-year reign at which uh, Satan will be released for a short time. And then you have the resurrection of the wicked for final judgment and a new heavens and new earth. That's millennialism. Okay? Doesn't quite sound right, right? Question I have here, if the true Christians are resurrected at this point, how is Christ reigning here? Okay? Uh, and they'll talk about, well, he's ruling over uh, in a golden age. Well, how's that happening? Because the church is, if the church has been resurrected and is out of here, how's the world going to hear the gospel? Okay. How is there a battle of Armageddon? How is there a tribulation uh, when there's only the evil forces of Satan and those who are in his camp? It doesn't make sense, right? So here's the true uh, biblical timeline here. Uh, at the cross, at, uh, Christ binds Satan. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has bound or cast out Satan. And that word casting out is... In a sense, he has cast out of heaven. He can no longer accuse. That's what Satan means, is the, the accuser. Okay? So you're reading chapter first couple chapters of Job, for instance. You see Satan going along with all the other angels up to God in heaven. Right? And what does he do? He accuses Job. Right? So at the cross, he is kicked out of heaven, out of the presence of God. He can no longer accuse you and me because Christ is, is one at all. Uh, then Christ reigns through his church. This is the thousand-year reign. Uh, so a thousand years is symbolic reign, typically meaning the total, complete number of days that God has allotted for this reign. Christ is reigning through the church. He's reigning through the gospel. Okay? All right. Uh, the Bible does talk about uh, near the end of the world, Satan will be re released for a short time to deceive the nations. And so that we have that here. Uh, but then after that time, Christ returns from the dead, uh, and, and you have the resurrection of the dead and judgment day. Uh, and then you have the new heavens and new earth. And those who are Christ go to be with Christ forever. And on um, the new heavens and new earth, those who don't believe go into eternal fire with Satan and his angels. Okay? Questions? Okay. I know there's a lot packed in there. I try to just kind of explain it in a little brief of a nutshell here. Uh, let's get into the rapture a little bit here. So, typically, uh, the word rapture uh, basically means to be caught up. Okay? So, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verse 13 through 18, uh, Paul says, but, do we, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Okay, so he's talking about those who are asleep, those who have gone to be with Christ. Their, their bodies are dead in the grave, 
but he's talking to people who are still left here, right? Um, he says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Okay? Uh, so he's talking about, he's going to bring them. When's that going to be? Uh, he says, well, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, when's the Lord coming? Last day. Okay? Context, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about the last day here. Okay? Will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Again, there's that raising again of, the, of those who are dead in Christ first. Then we who are alive, will, who are left, will be caught up, will be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What is the biblical understanding of that word rapture? It's simply meaning that we're caught up with those who, those who are alive, are caught up with those who have been raised from the dead, who are Christ, to meet the Lord in the air on the last day. That is the biblical understanding. It's not a secret return of Christ. Okay, That is a false teaching. How do we know? Context. Context. Okay. Uh, as my Greek and Hebrew professors would say, context is king. Okay. Because <laughs> you can't understand anything outside of context. Okay. So uh, the word uh, 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 we caught up is um, arpo, uh, I say arpa uh, gain so them. Wait, this is a tongue twister. Why? Um, arpa ge so metha. Uh, and so it's, will be caught up is a future tense verb. Okay, so okay, it's already a future tense. Okay, uh, this word forms the basis of the word rapture found in many evangelical circles. While it's used 14 times in the New Testament, it is, it is only here that it is used in the future sense. And it's only there that they use, they use it to refer to some sort of future rapture. Okay. Uh, so the context again, context is not a secret return of Christ, but a visible return of the last day. How do we know? Because the dead are raised and Christ is descending from heaven. Okay, context. Uh, we who are left is not talking about those left behind, but those who are still alive on the earth when Christ returns. And evidently, those who are left are the believers, right? We who are left. Paul is talking about believers who are left. So Christ isn't coming back again at some date to secretly rapture the whole church because there are Christians. The church remains, right? The church will remain forever and it will remain on the earth until the end of the days, okay? Um, so how does this false teaching of the rapture affect the mission of the church? You know, how does that affect the mission of the church? Well, God will sort it out on, through that tribulation, right? We don't have to worry about evangelizing, right? We got time. You know, the rapture hasn't happened yet. So we got time. You know, we can be a little complacent, maybe. Um, will the church remain until Christ returns? That's question 217. And the answer is yes. The church will remain until Christ returns. In fact, the church will remain for all eternity, right? Questions? So when people are caught up in the rapture, caught up, then won't there there'll be a thousand year reign? You're talking about the false teaching of the rapture. Right. Yes, so... Um, and then... Yeah, so, then there'll be a seven year tribulation, and, a, and after that, they have the battle of Armageddon, and then you have a thousand year reign, a golden age. A golden age. More Christians then? But the question, how can that be if the church is gone? Because I don't know. Rap, it says rapture all true Christians. Well, all true Christians, that's the church, isn't it? Should be all Christians that want my faith. 
right? So how can there be a thousand year reign then, right? I don't know. It, but many, it, there's much false teaching out there about the rapture. There is, and it's all garbage. Okay? So it, It's a teaching of Satan. So wouldn't you want to be caught up in the rapture? I mean, to be a Christian, because you don't know when this is going to happen. Again, when does the when does the rapture take place? What's the biblical teaching of this? Well, for us, it's the last day. Well, this is not say just for us. The biblical answer is the last day. Yes, that's the biblical answer. Right. Uh, because I don't want this becoming an us versus them. Is this is the biblical teaching? I don't care what denomination you're in. Right. The truth doesn't change, right? No, no, because that's. Yeah. We believe what's in the Bible. That's right. There's so many that are being falsely led. Yeah, they're duped. Why are they duped, though? Because they don't know the Word of God. Okay? That's why it's so important to know the Catechism, to get the basic teachings down so that when you're reading the Scriptures, you can understand the Scriptures. But that's a lifelong learning. Okay? I don't know everything. I'm continually learning, you know. And I'm when we get to eternity, it's going to be eternal getting to know God and exploring the depths of his word and his love and his grace for all eternity. That will never end. Uh, some of the other teachings is reincarnation. Again, that's a, uh, that's a false teaching as well. If you do not believe in reincarnation, uh, resurrection is not reincarnation. Uh, but something totally different. Okay? All right. I'm sorry we went over time on this one. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, but... Uh, We'll be getting into the Lord's uh, Prayer uh, next time, next week. Um, so let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, you have brought me to Christ, and by his gospel you promised me the final victory over sin, death, and the devil. Keep me firm and confident in the knowledge that on the last day you will raise all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ, my Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. All right. God's richest blessings on your day and week.